So yeah, so my name is Howard, Howard Bone, and I, I'm an artist, and sort of possibly a little bit like you. Uh, I don't know how much uh, science training you have already, but uh, sort of coming off the street and burning the stuff. Um, so I don't have a background in biology, uh, but I have had an interest in this form for some years. And um, uh, when there was a PhD up to do uh, something called computational art, I suggested, well, synthetic biology can be a form of computation. Um, so I suggested, well, why don't we try to focus this PhD on that? So they said, okay, we can do this. And um, so that's what I've been sort of playing around with. So we're going to have a look at some of the projects that I've worked with. Okay, so that's kind of my studio, uh, which is slightly different from, from what you normally know. And um, we, yeah, I'm come from a sort of uh, arts collective called C Lab, and Laura Chinti there, she works with me, and we also have a website called C Lab Co UK, where there's lots of resources if you're interested in this type of activities. And uh, a sort of previous project we worked on, uh, an example was the Martian Rose, where we went to uh, the planetary ch simulation chamber in Denmark and exposed a rose to Martian conditions. And uh, obviously there's very harsh conditions, so the roses, they freeze and they die, and then when you hold them up, they sort of fall apart like a limp wire, um, a bit in a cartoonish way. But it's, it's quite important because we don't normally experience these environments, we never see these places, and this is a way of actually getting a bit closer to what it means to be on Mars and to see rovers driving around. So bioart is normally about working with this type of material on discrete levels, which means proteins, cells, genes, etc. Yeah? So trying to, uh, to really see what we can produce using this type of um, uh, material. So uh, some examples of, uh, of something that has been happened already. Uh, uh, Joe Davis, for instance, at MIT, uh, he developed something called an um, audio microscope, uh, which he thought was quite interesting because it allows people that are um, blind to listen to uh, bacteria, kind of, well, see, kind of. Uh, and he also uh, made something called microvenus, which was an intervention. Uh, a long time ago, we sent up something called Voyager up into space with these uh, golden plaques but we forgot to show the, the female genitalia. genitalia. So, um, so he sort of put that back into space and he actually transported this message out into space by first uh, engineering a big map with this kind of uh, uh, figure uh, into, uh, into uh, a bit map and translating it and finally getting into the geno genetic sequence and implementing it in a bacteria. And the idea is that when we all die, the bacteria will still be around and, and the aliens will come and read it. Um, <laughs> so, so this is another sort of example of, uh, of a pioneer in the field. He breeds plants. So plant breeding is of course genetics and he breeds plants back into wilderness. Uh, and that's sort of going against some of the way we look at plant breeding today. We always try to make them beautiful and all of these kind of things. But he also thinks maybe we should look at nature and the world the wild and what that has to offer. And these are just some examples of some sort of other works that people are working with tissue. There's Joe Davis doing something with a frog. There's people just playing around with DNA and uh, or making sort of uh, uh, borrowing often from scientists, glowing organisms. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is to think of uh, how we can help the public, how we can help the world sort of broker this kind of understanding of this non-human things. To ask of people what, what, what are bacteria is, nobody will know really. They don't really understand what it is. Uh, what sort of interfaces we can make to to enable this sort of access and you know one of the problems that I work with IGEM is that when you try to put these things out in the public it's very difficult so one of the first thing I looked at was just growth I mean I went into the lab and I looked at the bacteria and I looked how they grow and I asked myself you know okay it grows I can see some some differences happening uh, but can I really can I make something that changes when they grow and so I, I drew a picture, uh, and I gave it to my supervisor, and I said, we make something like that, so it grows and it changes color. And you can sort of see clear splits in state. So what I wanted was that it grows, and when it starts to get stressed out here, that they change color. Um, 
And so we found a gene that was sort of of interest to this there. And that's something called, it's involved in, in many things, but one of them is the Krebs cycle. And that means that when the cells, when the cells get stressed, they, they, they get a lot of oxygen that is free in the cell. And this is detrimental to the cell, so they have an enzyme, and that enzyme can, can capture this oxygen and hold it together and make water. But if we, if we then take that enzyme and find the gene, and find the promoter for the gene, we can then use that to produce a color. So this is the sort of thinking I have to do. Um, and I had to go into the lab and I had to do all the thing. I had to, uh, I, at first I used, uh, this is the library I used, which is what you will be using if you work with this kind of thing. Uh, and finally, when I did all the transformation, I did all the ligation, I used synthetic biology, I put it together, I put the promoter in front of this kind of green fluorescent protein at the time, and I got it to glow when it got stressed. And that was, uh, that was quite uh, fantastic for me. And then I, I thought, um, so this is just one cell glowing when they're sort of expressing this thing. This is a, a lot of bottles glowing when they, when they get stressed. Uh, and this is a plate glowing as it gets stressed over a long time. But one of the problems I had was I had no control over the system. So what I wanted to build was a, was a way, a system that could uh, keep a steady population and I could just feed it a few parameters and I could get this light to fluctuate. And so I built something I call the stressostat. Uh, and this is the sort of, this is a window sort of thing. So when I feed it more or less light, it sort of starts fluctuating less light in the middle. This is just some images from my setup. So uh, then I also tried this with red and red fluorescent protein reacted completely differently. This is seeing seeing this bacterial culture growing from one single colony over many days, and you can sort of see the, the nice thing about red fluorescent protein is that you can actually see it. Uh, you can sort of start seeing the red is expressed on a natural plate. But then uh, finally, when I when I come to the end of this thing, I turned off the light, and but well, we let it go for a little bit, and you can sort of start seeing. It looks a bit like some person inside there. Um, but uh, but now you can see the red, and this is a swarming plate, and it's sitting at the bottom of the swarming swarming plate, and you can clearly see sort of red thing being produced. And then I swap the light, and this is what you see. And you can see the edges are red. And if you think about the first picture I produced, it looks a bit like that. Like that. Um, so then I, I looked at all sorts of other things. Yeah, uh, I looked at, for instance, this famous. Um, banana bacteria, and I tried to make it public, and I exhibit this in India in front of 90,000 people in three days. Um, and they all came and they smelled this system. Um, I'd like to show you a quick video if it's, if it's active. And you know, I had this in sort of a minimal media, and people were allowed to go for the first time, and actually, this is a, 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 a bacteria that has no natural smell. And when you add a specific construct, that produces this banana-like smell with, an, with another compound, you can actually smell a banana. It smells a bit sweet. It was, it was great. Here's another example. This is a bacteria compass I made. So here I use nanomagnetic particles in bacteria, and I can actually move bacteria around. Um, so I don't know if we can actually see it. Maybe see a little bit. See them sort of twirling. That's me with a magnet twirling them around. Um, Here's another uh, example. Uh, this is a light sensor, famous light sensor. I tried this out. This was quite difficult for me to do. And, uh, and this is an example of uh, something that you can just uh, buy from, um, you can get the whole sequence and you can sort of buy it, but it didn't work well. But this is sort of a heart you can see here yeah? that I've tried to produce them. I've also tried to work with agar in various forms. And this is an example of the work I tried to produce. It's not quite complete, but it's trying to make this bacterial world. So I'm casting agar in 3D. And that's really it for me. Uh, and you know, I've worked with the UCLI team for 2011 and 2012. We've had a really good round. We've, uh, we've sort of um, made molecular cocktails. We've taught DIY people. So we've had a lot of fun. And, and uh, you know, I thank them for letting me take part in you know, what you've done. Cheers. <laughs> Any questions?
pieces of artwork. So I wanted to know, you know what is it you want to do by making these things? What are your intentions? Uh, my intention, my actually it's changed quite a bit. My intentions originally was to um, make something uh, much more advanced than what I think I've made. And this is exploring the boundaries of where art practices is today. And can an artist walk into a lab and do these things? And it's extremely difficult. But you can do it. Uh, and, and by doing it, this is the act of doing that sort of shows that other people can overcome this. And this can become a new media for art practices as well. And then there's other things that overwhelm this, and, and UCLI, Jim Philip, uh, uh, is quite clear on this as well, is the problem of exhibiting it. You can make these works, but you can't actually put them out in the public. So nobody is allowed to see GMO normally. So that's one of the things I work really hard with. So can I, can I actually build a framework to take this stuff material and put it in a gallery so people can see? And what does it mean if people are allowed to see this in front of them and not just see it in, in a sort of like a, on a PowerPoint or something like that? What, is it, what difference does it make when you're presented with something living and get to think about that? Do you think your work will help the public to access and better Uh, for me, it's a difficult position because when you're when you're doing it, a lot of artists like to have a high level of critique. So the standard method of, of working is that you're you're going into a field and you're sort of adding a critique to the sciences. But at the same time, I'm taking part in it. So it's a difficult position. Um, I I try to I I'm not really about making them accept uh, you know making making them sort of be more uh, comfortable with it. But at the moment, I am. And the reason why I am at the moment is because I want to put it out there. And, and so I need to establish a sort of comfort zone around that. Once that's established, I I'm, can be allowed to, to be more critical about it myself. Yeah. <laughs>